Hello and welcome to The Global View on this Monday. Let's take a look at uh, what's going on at a macro level. US Treasury yields fell further on Friday to a two-month low before edging higher. The 10-year yield at 4.43%, the two-year rising five basis points to 4.89%. Now, the 10-year yield is down around 60 basis points from its October peak. Yields recovered after data showed that US housing starts increased marginally. In October, however, confidence among home builders has fallen to an 11-month low as the rate on the popular 30-year fixed mortgage averaged close to 7.8%, the highest since 2000. Further supporting Treasury yields were comments from Boston Fed President Susan Collins, who said, while evidence is growing that inflation is easing, she's not yet ready to rule out more rate hikes, saying in order to get back down to 2% in a reasonable amount of time, you need to be patient and resolute, and I wouldn't take additional firming off the table. Well, the US dollar posted its second steepest weekly decline against other major currencies for the year on Friday. The Aussie dollar currently trading 65.2 US cents. Now, the S&P 500 has gained 9% since late October. The index up nearly 18% for the year. That's less than 2% away from its year high that was reached in July. Investor optimism on equities has grown over the past few weeks. Stock exposure by active investment managers has shot up to its highest level since August from the one year low hit last month. That's according to the National Association of Active Investment uh, Managers. So is now the time to be buying equities. For a, a 2024 outlook, we're joined by Anthony Doyle from Firetrail. Good to see you. Cheers, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so what do you, you would have seen that chart there. What do you make of where we're at, particularly when you take a look at what's going on in the US at the moment? Of course, a lot of this generated by the assumption that the Fed is done. Uh, we are seeing some further data showing us the economy is slowing as they want. So how's that set us up, particularly, I guess, equities is concerned? Yeah, from that top down outlook perspective, we think there has been a lot of great work done by central banks around the world in order to get inflation back to more comfortable levels. For example, on terms of core inflation, you've seen 75% of the work done to, to get uh, core inflation back to central bank targets, which are typically between two to 3%. And we believe that trend is likely to continue going forward given the increase in interest rates that we've seen and money cancellation that's occurring via quantitative tightening. So when you think potentially six months forward, we might actually have inflation at a far more comfortable level in terms of those core numbers. We will have labor markets that remain relatively strong given real incomes are improving um, and that should provide support for consumption. And we'll have central banks around the world that have a significant amount of policy ammunition to deploy should uh, you start to see a weakening or a deterioration in the outlook for growth. And in that type of environment, that is an environment that is ripe for, for risk assets. Um, and that is an environment where you're likely to see risk premia absolutely collapse. Yeah, because you, you take a look at what futures markets are pricing in there at the moment, a 30% chance of a rate cut by March, uh, a better than even chance by May. Do you, do you feel as though perhaps the markets have got ahead of themselves at this point? I mean, and, and if that came to pass, what would the impact on equities be? I think the narrative has certainly shifted from concerns around inflation to concerns around the growth outlook. Mm. And on the growth outlook, I would say we're actually a bit more optimistic than the consensus. So for us, interest rate cuts by March, that would signal a pretty meaningful deterioration in the labour market and the outlook for growth. And, and we're not there. So we would be in the higher for longer camp. So whilst, uh, as I said, in central banks, they do have that policy that they can deploy should they need to, we think they'll be very slow to declare the war on inflation over. And given the support that the labour market will bring to real economic growth, actually interest rates may remain longer. So the market's probably a bit too bearish on the growth outlook pricing in those rate cuts so soon. Anthony, when we look at the performance of the US equity market uh, the year to date, of course, it's all been about the Magnificent Seven. Uh, just that, that outperformance, particularly with those tech stocks, a lot of it driven by speculation over AI. Is that likely to continue, do you think, relative to other global equity markets? I think the, the Magnificent Seven, there's a few things going on there. So you have the, the AI thematic, and that's obviously supported the valuation of NVIDIA in particular. 
Um, and you've had beneficiaries of that in, in Microsoft, in Alphabet, TSMC, Micron Technology as well. Secondly, uh, as you showed earlier, yields um, have fallen since October to the tune of around 60 basis points. That's helping growth stocks in particular. But I think the huge technical thematic that has supported the Magnificent Seven is if you're an equity fund manager, it's a place to hide. It's a place where you've got those defensive quality style characteristics. These companies are generating a lot of revenue. Their balance sheets are fundamentally very strong. And it's been a place for a lot of equity managers that have been hiding this year. Um, those that are questioning the outlook, those that are uncertain about the outlook. I certainly believe that next year uh, we will see the mid cap. That's where we see the, the best valuations in the US and globally. The mid cap part of the market for us is where valuations are most compelling. And that's where we're investing in opportunities today for the S3 Global Opportunities Fund. Well, let's go there then as to where exactly you're seeing those opportunities then. So the top overweight in our fund today is a company named AutoZone listed on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, an auto parts supplier. Um, and they have a dominant distribution presence throughout the Midwest of America. Um, and where AutoZone are particularly strong is in their fulfillment of orders, both for the professional mechanic sector, for example. So what, what matters if you're a mechanic is that you can turn over your customers' cars relatively quickly, and AutoZone are making four deliveries a day. Indeed, if a spark plug is ordered or a machine part is ordered for a car, and that order isn't fulfilled within 10 minutes, the store manager will go out and del deliver it. So there's that strong emphasis on the customer experience. What is growing for AutoZone is the DIY sector. As you showed earlier, not only have rates on mortgages increased, but so um, have interest rates on auto loans, as we know. So cu customers, the DIY sector, are running their existing cars for longer, and they're undertaking repairs themselves. And AutoZone is taking market share in that sp space as well. Very good management that have been at the company for um, a considerable amount of time, and they have a very strong emphasis of, um, of capital discipline. So essentially 90% of uh, earnings or 90% of free cash flow is returned to shareholders in the form of buybacks. Really great company. Mm -hmm. Sits in the consumer discretionary sector, yeah. but a more defensive play there. Yeah, extensive uh, chain of stores, more than 7,000 across the US, Mexico, Brazil. However, um, just wondering, the longer term story for companies like this, uh, the afterparts market for cars. What's the effect of the rise of the EV going to have on those? Because clearly you don't need to have too many parts to replace on an EV. That's right. So an EV typically, in terms of the, the drivetrain, around 80 parts. Mm. For an internal combustion engine vehicle, it's over 10,000 parts. Um, so there is a difference there but it will take a significant amount of time for the existing vehicle stock to be replaced by EVs. Um, not only that, but EVs are actually harder wearing on components such as brake pads, given the acceleration, but also the weight of EVs as well. So you're talking about a thematic that is well off into the future before it actually has a significant impact on the earnings profile of a company like AutoZone. All right. Another company you're looking at, Ryan Specialty. So this is in the insurance space. Exactly. So they're an insurance broker and they specialise in a growing uh, segment of the insurance industry, which is uh, excess and surplus insurance. So in terms of management, uh, the company was started in 2010 by a guy named Pat Ryan, uh, hence the name. And Pat's actually famous for starting Aon, the insurer. Um, so he retired and he saw an opportunity in this space um, uh, the fastest growing um, space within the insurance sector. And there's basically risks that are very difficult to insure. So whether you've got a house on a floodplain, for example, and you're finding it difficult to gain insurance, whether you work in a high risk profession, whether your business um, uh, in terms of cyber security, that's a growing part as well, which uh, insurers are starting to split out from standard insurance policies, or whether you're a professional soccer player that wants to insure your legs you will typically go to the excess and surplus market. Um, and Ryan, as the wholesale broker, they're not taking any balance sheet risk. So they act as an intermediary, they have the best relationships in the US, and they're benefiting from that structural growth within the sector. 
sports insurance. That's a fascinating place to be, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think Ju- uh, Julia Roberts, she sponsored her smile, for example, <laughs> and Ronaldo, he sponsored his legs or the, the football team that he plays for does. So um, you'd be surprised, maybe a, a Google search for, for the viewers to see all the types of insurance policies that are out there. And there's some great ideas to think about right there. Thanks for joining us on Fire Trail. Cheers, Andrew. All right, that is the global view. In fact, uh, just before we finish, um, a point to, we were talking about AI, Microsoft shares. Now, they're going to be closely watched when the markets open in the States after OpenAI ousted Chief Executive Sam Altman, uh, the chat GPT maker, uh, the board there saying it lost confidence in his ability to lead, though there are rumours this morning that he will be brought back into the fold. Microsoft owns a substantial stake in OpenAI, and the board saying that his departure followed a deliberative review process by the board, which concluded that he was not consistently candid in his communications with the board, hindering its ability to exercise its responsibilities. And OpenAI's chief tech officer, Mira Manrati, will serve as interim CEO while OpenAI conducts formal search for the permanent replacement. Just before we go, a check of where we're likely to open. Uh, SPY futures up four-tenths of a percent. Stay with us. The open is just a couple of minutes away.